Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. All right, what's going on, guys? This is Rob, and we are continuing on with our story on the Eternals. But there's a few things that I want to clear up here. Yes, this bit of a battle does face, or really has, like, Thanos facing off against the Eternals. More Icarus than the rest of the Eternals, but it's a battle between the Eternals and, and Thanos nonetheless. Uh, but I also want to kind of talk about Thanos and how he relates to the Eternals. Now, I know a lot of you guys who have been around my channel for a long time already know this, so kind of bear with me for a minute, because we got a whole bunch of new subscribers with the, the Icarus Explained video that we did and, and so on. So Thanos is in and of himself an Eternal, but he's an Eternal with a Deviant gene. So depending on what comic book fans you talk to, some people will say that he's just a Deviant. Others will say that he's an Eternal with a Deviant gene, and some will say he's a hybrid of both. The importance behind this is that Thanos is, in some form or fashion, tied into the genetic makeup of an Eternal. He was technically born to both Eternals. He was born to Suisan and Lars, both of whom are pure Eternals. So again, it's one of those weird little concepts. The reality of this is that we can really look at Thanos more is like a mutant among his own race. In the same way that like Wolverine's considered a mutant among the human race, that Thanos is the same way. That seemingly every Eternal has like a dormant deviant gene, but it just never seems to activate. And Thanos is the unique exception among his own people where being born with a deviant gene, that deviant gene was a primary gene. That deviant gene was basically a dominant gene instead of a recessive gene. And that's why he looks the way he does. Now Thanos being a member of the Eternals is exceedingly important. And the reason why is is because Thanos being able to travel through the eternal gates by way of the machine is something that can only truly be done by a person who is of pure eternal blood. Now, a person who is not in eternal can do it, but they have to be given passage by eternals. Essentially, they have to be given the key to open the doors by the eternals themselves. But the important thing here is that with Icarus having shown up at basically the ruins of Titanos, finding it more or less destroyed, and Thanos occupying that space, the two of them get into a battle. Now, something that I want to stress here, this is the first time in Marvel Comics that the Eternals and, and really Icarus himself has actually fought Thanos. This has never really happened before. And so in a lot of ways, you're kind of talking about what would normally be an even battle between two characters. But one thing to keep in mind, Thanos is banned from the realm of Mistress Death. He is effectively immortal. And so because of that, he has everything he needs in order to essentially survive whatever force he faces off against. Now, he's not immutable and indestructible. If his physical body is incapable of surviving an experience, he'll more or less die. That's one of those instances where like Drax the Destroyer comes into play, right? During Annihilation, Thanos was technically banned from the realm of Mistress Death, but Drax the Destroyer was able to kill him because it's a power imparted to Drax by the cosmic entity Kronos that Drax can kill Thanos. So it almost kind of triumphs or almost kind of trumps the power of Mistress Death, not officially in the sense that when Thanos was killed, his body simply ceased to function because his heart was ripped out. So don't try to compare it one for one. Like if Iron Man ripped out the heart of Thanos, would he also stay dead in that capacity? This is one of those instances when Marvel just kind of cooks the books for the purpose of telling a story. So it doesn't really apply universally across the board. It's what we call comic book logic. It's a plot device. It just exists to tell a story, right? So that's one of the unique aspects of Drax. But the important thing is the machine basically opens a portal and then their fight actually takes place through time. Now, while these two are fighting, I want to kind of explain the machine a little bit. So the machine, as it's described to us, was given to us in Eternals in 2006, but there really isn't much in the way of explanation regarding what the machine is. That is to say, we don't know if it was created by the Eternals. We don't know if it was created by the Celestials to control the Eternals. We don't really know or really have much information behind it. All we really know is the machine is both itself a physical device, but it also represents the, the system of the Eternals, right? Their hierarchy, how it is that they exist, the idea of bringing people back from the dead, different things like that. That's all part and parcel to the machine. And so the machine itself is kind of a coming together of smaller machines in the sense that if you remember our last video, we talked about how there are different tribes of Eternals across the world in the same way that you have like different tribes of Inhumans, different things along those lines. While you have Eternals in different locations, an Eternal in Titanos can travel through the gateway to an Eternal in Polaria, and much the same way with them going vice versa. And so it's smaller machines that make all that possible, and all those small machines make up the larger machines. So again, it's kind of weird, right? It's like how all 50 states make up the United States of America. It's the easiest way to understand that. Now, the important thing between the fight of these two is that Icarus was never going to win the fight with Thanos, right? That was never going to happen. And the reason why is because Icarus just doesn't have the power to pull this off. But at the end of the day, 
the fight between the two is such that Thanos overpowers Icarus and actually rips his head off, only for us to realize it was a construct created by the machine. But the reality of Thanos being able to pull this off is that one, Thanos is temporarily incapacitated, and two, Icarus and Sprite get out of there as fast as they can. Because if Thanos gets his hands on the real Icarus, he'll kill him, right? That's just the reality of the situation that we're facing off against is that Thanos is just that much more powerful than the Eternals. And so following that, Icarus basically travels to Olympus, right? Basically where the Eternals are currently residing and meets with the rest of them and effectively tells them Thanos is here on Earth and Thanos is the reason why all this happened. Now, I wouldn't go so far as to say the Eternals panic, but they do understand the threat of the situation. One of the other things they refer to Thanos as is the sin of Titan. During the original Thanos Rising storyline, and even before that, back in the day, it was kind of established by Jim Starlin, Thanos effectively eradicated all of his race on Titan, right? That there were a lot of Eternals who lived there. And during his journey, when he was manipulated by Mistress Death, he actually left Titan. And then eventually he came back with an army he had amassed and eradicated everybody there. It's considered a unconscionable sin for somebody, for an Eternal to basically commit genocide against their own kind, to take out the entirety of the Eternals race, or at least those Eternals who lived on, uh, lived on Titan, that was unheard of. Under normal circumstances, a crime like that, Thanos would be locked in the exclusion zone, but there was no one there to stop him, right? Thanos was of such a power to where nobody could really stand against him. And so that's why he's considered to be the sin of Titan, because Thanos is the Eternal who went awry, right? He's the Eternal who became a bad guy, blinked out half the life in the universe during the original Infinity Gauntlet story, has done things like that time and time again, where he's been a credible threat, not just to Earth or even the Eternals on Titan, but to the universe as a whole. And so because of that, the question becomes, what are we going to do here? But the funny thing about this is that while Icarus pleads with the Eternals, some of them don't actually believe that Thanos is here, that surely somebody would have noticed if that was the case. And so it's one of these things where when Icarus says that Thanos had actually traveled through the Eternal Gates, they kind of say, well, Thanos is not a true Eternal. But the answer to that question is, if Thanos is not a true Eternal, how is he able to travel the Eternal Gates if nobody gave him permission to do so? And so only one of two things is possible here. Either we're basically looking at Marvel telling us Thanos is really a true Eternal, he just has the Deviant Gene, or the history of Thanos is still intact in the sense that because he had the Deviant Gene, it's like putting iodine in a drop of water. It permeates and it kind of makes him an impure Eternal and not a true Eternal, which is kind of what his history sort of been. Again, depending on what comic book fan you talk to and how Marvel interprets that. The important thing here is that if he's not necessarily a true Eternal, then it means somebody let him in. That means that, that there's basically a spy among their ranks or a traitor and somebody is essentially letting him into this place. The other part of that is when they had traveled to, to the exclusion zone in an attempt to find out when Zeros was going to be resurrected due to the fact that he's the prime Eternal, the news they get is that all the wardens in the exclusion zone are dead. There's nobody there to resurrect Zeros. And so in essence, the dead will stay dead. This is exceedingly important. And the reason why is because what it means is there's no resurrection for the Eternals. That Marvel, as the if the Eternals start dying over the course of the story, Marvel's effectively thinning the herd. If I'm a betting man here, the reason why Marvel would be doing this is because they're going to thin the roster down so the comic book roster matches the Marvel Cinematic Universe roster. It's kind of what Marvel Comics does now. Marvel follows the MCU as opposed to the MCU following Marvel. But again, it's, it's kind of an interesting concept because in the midst of all that, while all this kind of accusation is going on with regards to Druig and kind of pointing the finger at Icarus and saying, hey man, you've had time, you've had opportunity, you know, to, to take out Zeros so that you could kind of take your place back as the Prime Eternal if that's what you wanted to do. Maybe your anger or jealousy that Zeros replaced you as the Prime Eternal, whatever logic makes sense to you. And then you come to us with this story about how the sin of Titan, the mad Titan himself, Thanos, has somehow made his way to Earth with no one knowing he's here and he's the one behind it all. What a convenient excuse, right? What a convenient finger to point that it's Thanos that caused all this. And so Cersei ultimately pops up and says, no, right? This is not going to happen. Even if there is some measure of truth to what you're saying, Druig, which there's not, but even if it was something like Icarus who did all this, now is not the time for Eternals to turn against Eternals. That's not what needs to happen here. The biggest problem with this that you have is kind of a bit of an emergency going on at the moment is the machine is effectively failing. That if a portion of the machine is damaged, then the entire machine is damaged. What's kind of going on here is that by, by virtue of Thanos, presumably Thanos, wiping out all those wardens in the exclusion zone and then destroying the portion of the machine that deals with, with resurrecting uh, Eternals who have died, it's like pulling out the bottom piece on a Jenga set at the wrong time. It's only a matter before it all comes crashing down. And when that happens, because the machine is tied into the biosphere of Earth, if the machine fails, the biosphere of Earth fails. Basically, it becomes an uninhabitable planet. This, I would say, is something akin to a plot device to a degree, but not necessarily. At least that'd be kind of the, the throwaway or the immediate response. But the nature of the Eternals is that they are tied irrevocably into the existence of the Earth itself. And assuming the machine was created by the Celestials, 
and left here to control the Eternals, what better way to do that than to tie the habitability of the planet into the machine itself, right? Keep the machine intact, make sure it runs like it's supposed to, and you'll continue to survive. It's one of those interesting concepts that Marvel sort of throws in there. And so ultimately, the questions asked of the machine, uh, who did this, right? Like, who gave Thanos the ability to travel here to Earth by way of the Eternal Gateways? And the response of the machine is, I can find no data on the exception. I'm unable to remove that exception. In effect, what it looks like is, again, one of two things. Either Thanos is a true Eternal and can travel from one gateway to the other, which they more or less said that can't be the case, or there's somebody who allowed, who made an exception for Thanos and then wiped that exception from the database. So once Thanos was here, they removed the exception. And so as far as the machine's concerned, there was no exception. And so there's no exception to remove. So in essence, if there is a traitor, they snuck Thanos on board Earth to wipe out the rest of the Eternals. We don't necessarily know who that person is or why they would have done it. At the moment, because the story follows Icarus, there's really nothing he can do here, right? I mean, there is a little bit of, uh, of speculation that Sprite might be involved, but nothing of any real seriousness here. And so at this point, it's really more of a whodunit mystery. Who brought Thanos to Earth? And why are they allowing Thanos to kill off all the various Eternals across the planet? And so what you end up doing is actually traveling to New York to Toby Robson, because as we saw in the previous story, there was a kind of vision that Icarus got that Toby Robson had essentially been killed and Icarus saw it as a failing of his. Now, there is a kind of motivation behind this, which actually sort of jumps back to a previous moment in Icarus's life when he had stumbled across a man who kind of existed on an island and basically asked him, have you seen a monster? Of course, referring to the Deviants. And when the answer of the, of the man is, I've never seen a monster like that, the only monster he has is a kind of fish, then he basically tells him, build a pyre here, and that when a monster comes or when a Deviant comes, light the pyre and then I will respond. But because of the fact that no Deviants came over the course of this man's life, this guy quite literally just sat there waiting for monsters to show up. They never did. And so he ended up just kind of dying here. Now, Icarus eventually showed up when the man was basically buried by his family and the pyre was lit in order to burn his body. And Icarus thought a monster had been summoned. This is really kind of designed to tie into the nature of Icarus himself. This is one of the things that we explained when we talked about his character explanation in the video that we did, which you'll find down in the description, that Icarus has lived for countless eons. And so what would be 90 years is just a blink of an eye in his life. It might be minutes as far as his mind comprehends it. And so the result of this is that when he tells the sky, stay here and light a pyre so that if the monsters ever return, then I'll be here to fight them, that this man's life was 90 years. For Icarus, it just felt like a matter of minutes. And so the people here, his family, just scream and cuss at, uh, at Icarus because of the fact that basically this man wasted his life. He just sat there and just waited for monsters to show up and they never did. But ultimately, a giant deviant arrives here and it really kind of shines into sharp relief the fact that presumably over the course of this man's life, he told them of the mission that was given to him by what he perceived to be a god. And while they kind of wrote it off as being nonsense and, and ridiculous, in this moment, the man's words all hail supreme. But it's really a small comfort to his family because at the end of the day, he still wasted his life, right? And so again, that seems to be why Icarus is really looking to protect Toby Robson the way he is, because it's more or less kind of making amends for a previous failure over the course of his life. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you all later. Peace.